Our scripture today is John 15, 9 to 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. This Sunday's gospel begins and ends with Jesus talking about love. That's an appropriate designation. But there's much more going on in this paragraph than mere mutual love. We learned that discipleship was not the disciples' idea. They are with Jesus, listening to him in this intimate setting, not because of their eye for talent. Jesus says to them, you didn't choose me. But I chose you and appointed you so that you could go and produce fruit so that your fruit could last. As a result, whatever you ask in my father's name will be given to you. I give you these commandments so that you can love each other. These disciples have been chosen. Note it, not for inside knowledge or cozy collegiality, but for the bearing of fruit, chosen to bear fruit, to multiply the love. I, while we were having communion, I kept thinking that phrase from Paul that uh, what he had received, he now gives to others. The, the receiving and the giving part are part of our relationship in Christ being able to bear the fruit he gives us, the fruit of love. I want you to notice in the text how Christ directly calls his followers friends, not servants, friends. We may not realize it, but Jesus is making a powerful insinuation about his relationship to the disciples. Sort of reminds me of a story I heard many years ago and this is a dated story, about a family who bought a new television set. And back in that day, you needed to put up one of those huge, ugly antennas on top of your roof to get the signal. Since they only had the simplest of tools, they weren't making much progress. That is, until a man who was new on the block appeared with an elaborate toolbox with everything they needed to get the antenna up in record time. It was like a George DeMar right there when you needed him. And as they stood there congratulating themselves of getting that antenna up with this good piece of luck of this neighbor showing up with the right tools, they asked their neighbor what he made with such fancy tools. And looking at all of them, he smiled and answered, friends, mostly, friends. Friendship is a gift. You can't force someone to be your friend. Friendship is offered as a gift, but having received the gift of friendship, it's only natural for you to feel obligated to your friend. As someone has said, you know you have a best friend when you call and say, I'm moving today and need someone to help me lift the refrigerator into the van. And the person says, sure, I'll be right over. When you have a friend, it's only natural, that you want to please your friend. There is a free giving and receiving that takes place. That relationship proceeds as a response to our friendship. Similarly, I want to propose that the way we live our lives as Christians is our response 
to the gracious love of God. God's love produces God's kind of love in us. A young as a young theology student at Oxford, John Wesley, founder of Methodism, earnestly wanted to be a good Christian. He founded the Holy Club, which imposed rigorous self-discipline and strict performance of good works upon its members. But Wesley's good works and high conduct gave him little joy. John and his brother Charles traveled across England to visit the great Christian teacher, William Law, who told them that they were trying to make something complicated and burdensome out of the simple blessing of Christianity. Religion is the plainest and simplest thing in the world, Law told the two earnest young men. It's just this. We love because he first loved us. Yes, we love because he first loved us. There you have it. When Christians do good things, they do them not to get anywhere. They do them because Jesus inspires it in them. In this Sunday's gospel, Christ says clearly and explicitly that he has made us his friends. That enables us to live our lives as those who have been befriended. There is a vast difference, I think, between the ethics of achievement that we often see in our world today and the ethics of response to genuine friendship. Christian ethics, I think, consume part of that last thing, the ethics of friendship. And it's more than an attempt to just do good. For as Luther found, our doing good is often just one more misdirected attempt to win God over to our side when all along God is on our side. You see, the Christian does not love his or her neighbor because the neighbor is a nice person or because the neighbor deserves love or because the neighbor returns love. The Christian loves in response to the love with which God has loved him or her. The Christian loves first because of what she or he believes about God, not because of something she or he believes about humanity. That is why Christian love is often more persistent and more radical than mere humanitarian love. Christian love is more than a feeling. Feelings are notoriously fickle. Nowhere in the Bible is love defined as a feeling. In the biblical sense, love is an activity, a decision, a response, something you decide to do because of what you know that God has decided for you. So our motivation for goodness is that Christ has made us God's friends, and that friendship gradually makes us better persons than we would be without the friendship. Christian faith says that people are not helpless lambs, that they are not the scum of the earth, that they are not the accidental byproducts of a chemical reaction in the cosmos. They are friends of God. Our message to one another is to affirm that true strength comes from the confidence of knowing who we really are as friends of God. True strength comes not from the rock-hard, self-centered, and self-sufficient facade put up by some so-called strong people. Instead, true strength comes from the God-given confidence and grace of knowing our secure place as friends of God. Someone remarked once that real friends are those who, when you've made a fool of yourself, don't feel you've done a permanent job. Well, similarly, we can be secure. We can be secure because God does not give up on us. And that's the message of Scripture. Brings me back to this thing about Christian ethics. I believe Christian ethics are based upon relationship our relationship with God and one another. There, there's something to be said about that characterization, particularly as we listen in on Jesus' conversation with his disciples. He tells them, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. If you obey my commands, 
you will remain in my love and my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. I don't know why, but that verse seems to go by so many of us in the faith. This is an important declaration by Jesus of our relationship and what that relationship is supposed to be doing, reflecting the love that we have been given. He goes even further by suggesting how one will lay his life down for his friends. Exactly what he has done for us. Sometimes I think we get a distorted idea about what love is. We, we tend to miss that part of sacrifice. For example, one night a, a man decided to show his wife how much he loved her. After dinner, he began to recite romantic poetry, telling her he would climb the high mountains to be near her, swim wide oceans, cross deserts in the burning heat of the day, and even sit at her window and sing love songs to, to her in the moonlight. After listening to him go on for some time about this immense love he had, she ended the conversation when she asked, but will you wash the dishes for me? Jesus describes a relationship that comes with responsibilities, commitments to one another. How, how is it that we organize our relationships anyway? You know, Children seek rules, black and white codes of conduct, uh, simplistic canons of what is always right and what is always wrong. Even we adults clamor for laws and structure, lines that we cannot cross. We ask Jesus for rules. He gave us only one, just one. Love one another as he loved us. It seems to me that only secure, strong persons have the wherewithal to love others selflessly like Christ. In the giving away of their love, they don't feel that they're giving up something, being deprived of something, even sacrificing something. For the one who truly loves because love is a blessing in itself, love is the highest expression of strength and power. When we can truly love for the sake of love, we discover unrivaled joy. It makes us better. It makes those in relationship with us better. It reproduces itself. Can you imagine that and envision that in our lives in Christ? What he has done for us and our changing ourselves and and trans, being transformed by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit, and going out into the world, touching other lives, that they too can be transformed the same way. It reproduces itself. Uh, too often, much of our love is subtle selfishness, in which things are done in order to get things done. One seeks compensation, don't we? Genuine Christian love is the selfless love that is produced by loving friends. Worldly love is the love which loves in an, in an attempt to achieve some sort of self-gratification. Christian love, again, gives without expectation of return or any need of for being returned. Its goal is to help the one they love to grow and to discover the best that they can be. In a survey I saw a few years ago, men were asked, why they enjoyed marriage. A predominant response was, my wife has helped me to be a better person. The relationship these men enjoyed in marriage had been fruitful for their character. That's somewhat analogous to the claim made for our friendship with Christ. It just makes us better. First Peter, I love First Peter, says the same thing, but uses different words. Maybe you recall these words. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. Once you haven't received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
You see, God made us more than we were. I want to close with a little story about a young man named Clayton. He was celebrating his fourth birthday. Because four years old is a very special, special age, his mother told him that he could have any kind of birthday party he wished. I want a party where everyone will be kings and queens, Clayton replied without a moment's hesitation. His wish was granted. His mother started to work, creating a score of golden paper crowns, royal blue crepe paper robes with gold lining, and scepters made from coat hangers and cardboard. Then the afternoon of the party came. As the guests arrived, they were delighted to receive royal crowns, robes, and scepters. Everyone at the party was either a king or a queen, and everyone had a wonderful time at Clayton's party. All the guests enjoyed the cake and ice cream. They had a majestic procession up to the end of the block and back. All looked like kings and queens. All believed they were kings and queens. Moreover, they all acted like kings and queens. They all behaved in a most royal manner. That night when the guests had all gone home when the cake and ice cream had all been put away, Clayton was being tucked into bed by his mother. Clayton said, I wish everyone in the whole world could be a king or queen, not just on my birthday, but every day. Well, Clayton, Something very much like that happened 2,000 years ago at a place called Calvary. We who were nobodies became somebodies. If we could all believe that, perhaps we could start acting like that. So let's go out from this time of worship renewed in our friendship with God, determined to show the world the fruitfulness of friendship with Christ. Amen. God bless you.